So tonight we're going to pick up uh, where Jim left off the week before because he went back to cover something last week. So we're going to be in chapter Isaiah chapter 45 tonight. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this today. Salvation, as we know it, seems real weird to outsiders, doesn't it? I mean, look at it this way. You're, you're a person. You do bad things. These things are a defense to God. And in actuality, you do bad things as rebellion against God and God's law. And these bad things you do are against God. And it's God who you wronged. And, but get this, he came to the earth as a man, Jesus, born of a virgin. And also, he could grow up and die for you and me. Doesn't that sound a little weird? Uh, if you've never heard that, his death paid for all the wrongs you've ever done. Uh, I, he, uh, and if you believe in God, that he did all this, that he, but you believe what he says, he's going to forgive you of all your wrongs. Just forgive him. Sounds kind of weird for some of you, doesn't it? I mean, if, if you're looking at this from an outsider point of view, you're like, yeah, it's kind of strange. Why, why can't he just say, hey, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. I like you. You're, you've done enough good. I, why can't God just do that? He's God, you know. Why did he have to go through this dying thing and all that? Salvation doesn't make sense to an outside world. Uh, they're wondering, why did Jesus have to die? Why? I, I don't get this. Why did God wait? 4,000 some years to send Jesus. Why not send Jesus right after, the, after Adam and Eve fell? I mean, take care of the whole thing right up front. You know, these are the questions. None of this makes sense to outsiders. But to us who are being saved, it's the power, right? You know, um, to our, our neighbors, our friends, our families, it doesn't make sense to them, and it didn't probably make sense to us before we got saved, did it? But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. However, or for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no mind can conceive, the things of God, the things God has prepared for those who love him. This is God's plan. Salvation is God's way of dealing with sin. We, we don't have to understand God's ways. God is higher than us. He's all-knowing. That's what makes him God. If we knew everything, we'd be God, right? But we don't. It's God's wisdom, God's timing, not ours. But was, what our, what's ours to know is this. There is a God in heaven, the creator of everything, to whom we have rebelled to whom we owe. And that payment, that penalty is death and ultimately to face his wrath. But in his love for us, he came to the earth to be born of a man, born as a man of a virgin birth so that he was sinless, so that he was perfect, so that he could be the one to pay that price for my sin. He took my place. He paid the death that I was supposed to, that I deserved. He took the penalty and the wrath that I deserved. That's what's mine to know, that God saved me, and he asks me to take him at his word and believe in him for my salvation. That's mine to know. Why and how, that's up to God. All I know is what's written in the word. This word is powerful. It's alive. It's active. And so tonight, we're going to study this word. We're going to look at it. Though there's mysteries that we don't understand, though there's timings and everything that we may not understand, what we can know is what God says is true. Every word of it is true. Let me pray for us. Dearly Father, Lord, we, we give you this time, Lord. We come to you. We want to hear from you. Lord, your, your word says that your words will never come back to you void. So, Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts to the point that your words would penetrate our hearts and that would sink deeply into our lives, so much so that any change that is necessary, any wrong that we've, needs to be corrected, Lord, we pray that you would do that in our lives as we study your word. Lord, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what you have to say to us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
So, you know, there's only two options. Either believe God's word, that he is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do, or take our chances. Will my good outweigh my bad? Am I a good enough person? Can I go to church enough? Can I tithe enough? That's religion. What we have is a relationship. So tonight we're going to look at the last half of 45, and it's all about Isaiah 45, and it's all about being able to trust God's word because of who he is and to trust that he will save those who put their faith in him. That's what we're going to study tonight. So uh, we're going to start in verse 15. He left off in verse 14, so we're going to pick up in verse 15. Truly, you are a God. This is Isaiah speaking to the Israelites. They're in captivity in, in Babylon, so they're sitting there thinking, oh, get us out of this. You know, We need help. We need freedom right now. But this is God. Speak, Israel's, uh, this is Isaiah speaking for God to the, to the Israelites, to the Jews. Truly, you are a God who has been hiding himself the God and Savior of Israel. Isaiah isn't saying that God cannot be found, but rather that God's ways can be a mystery to us. In fact, Isaiah will say in chapter 55, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord's. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God already declares that we won't understand everything he does. Have you ever been in that situation? The Israelites are finding themselves in captivity. You're like, I, I don't understand, God. Why won't, why won't you answer me? Why, why can't I hear you? Why, why can't I get direction in this? Why? We all have times where we're like, God, why? Sometimes he just wants us to trust in him. Truly, you are God, the God and Savior of Israel. That's what we should know about God. That's the kind of thing that keeps you going through the hard times, knowing that God is, the, is our Savior. Stand upon these truths. Um, one thing that uh, I... I had to learn, it's take, I'm still learning, is to learn the truths and the promises that are found in this word so that they can carry me through those hard times. And that's what, he, that's what Israel had to learn. He had, they had learned that uh, they needed to be carried through those times by the truth of what they know about God. And yeah, they're begging for release from bondage. They're begging to get out of Babylon. But that isn't the salvation God has for them at this time. But God can be found, and he can be known by us. God wants to be known by us. He wants a relationship with us. Let me say something. If, if you come to church, and you go home, and you come to church, and you go home, you come to church, and you go home, and that's it, you have a religion. If you say, I never hear from God. I've never heard God speak to me. Either you aren't listening or you don't have a relationship. It's that simple. Uh, I don't want anybody to doubt their salvation here tonight, but God is in the business of having a relationship with us. We should expect to hear from God. We should expect to find God when we seek him. Now, is he going to answer the way we want? Not always. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. But he wants a, a relationship with us. And the only way to hear him is through that relationship. Uh, but God wants to be found by us. He wants to be known by us. His desire is that all mankind would seek him. The problem is that most won't. Most will look to other things or they'll look to themselves. In fact, verse 16, all, of the, make, all the makers of idols will be put to shame and disgraced. They will go off into disgrace together. That is, they will one day find that all their hopes, what they put all their hopes in, will fail. Uh, all, that they, all, all that they trusted in is senseless idols. It's not even a, an actual thing. They just trusted senseless idols. And you know, for us today, you could say, well, I don't, I don't have a little figurine on my shelf that I sit down and worship. 
No, but we tend to have other idols. Uh, I remember, I think I told this at the men's breakfast last a uh, couple Saturdays ago, that when I was 15, my dad bought me a 1971 Chevelle. It was just a shell of a car. And w- when I got my license, I was still working on it. I had to put a motor in it. I had to, put, I had to do everything to it. And that car became an idol to me. It was my idol. And God had to take that away from me because I was trusting in that. I was looking to that. I, you know what? I was spending time on that. Rather than spending time with God, I was spending time on that. And God will give us that choice. You know, he doesn't say, I'm going to force you to worship me. No, we freely have that choice. But we will one day, like these makers of idols, if we follow after those idols, we will be put to shame and disgrace. We will go off into disgrace together. We will find that it was senseless to follow after the things of this world. When God returns to judge sinners, they will finally realize how pointless it was to chase after the things of this world. The Apostle John says this world and all of its desires are passing away, but whoever believes in Jesus will live forever. Jesus said, store for yourself treasure in heaven, not on the earth. You know, there's, there's, we have a perspective problem. And it seems to be getting worse. The older I get, I notice this. It seems to be getting worse. That my perspective is, or, or communally, as Americans mainly, but as people who live on the earth, our perspective is right here and now. I need to see it. I need to feel it. I need to touch it. And I need to have it. And if I want it, I need to get it. And, and I don't care. And one day, sadly, when, when, when the judgment seat happens, we'll find out that that was worthless. Do you want to be counted among those who are put to shame because they trusted in stuff rather than God? This is a warning to the Israelites, but it's a warning for us as well. Either we trust in God or we trust in ourselves and in stuff. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. Either we trust in God or we trust in the world. Verse 17. But Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will never be put to shame or disgraced to ages everlasting. Isaiah is primarily referring to the Jews in Babylon. That is, those Jews who are true Israel. Paul in Romans 2 writes that a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly or born that way, nor is of circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly uh, of the heart by the spirit, not by written code. So as Abraham believed and it was accounted to him, credited to him faith, the righteousness, that's how Israel, that's what he's talking about. True Israel will be saved. Those who put their faith and trust in God. Not those who merely have a religion. And the same is true of us today. I mean, just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than just walking into, well, this morning I walked into Krispy Kreme. And I I didn't climb on the conveyor belt or anything. But I was not a donut just walking in there. Walking out, I... May have added a, but I'm, but I was not a donut just by walking into Krispy Kreme, nor am I a car by walking into my garage. A Christian is a person whose life's been changed and saved by Jesus Christ, and that's it. And how are they saved? By the power of God, just by each and every one of us. We are saved not by our flesh. Not by our works, but by the power of God. Uh, No no human could have saved the Jews from Babylon. Nor can no human save somebody from hell. Only God can do that. That is something only God can do. And, And when God saves, it's an everlasting salvation. They're looking for temporary salvation. And God is offering eternal salvation. We, sadly, a lot of times are looking for temporary pleasure and temporary salvation from the things of this world and everything. And God is offering us eternal salvation. 
something that will last. God's plan has always been a permanent, eternal salvation. Verse 18, For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, He founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. What this means is if God said it, you can believe it. You won't find God's word to fail. You won't, you won't find God unable or unwilling to save or to rescue. Psalms 46, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Remember those promises I talked about? This is one of them. There's no need to fear when you trust God. Yeah, we do. I mean, we're human. We do. We, you know, rent check comes, or rent, rent uh, notice comes, and we're like, oh, am I going to have enough money this month? You know, somebody, somebody passes away. Oh, what am I going to do without them? We fear those things. We fear life. We fear death. We fear the unknown. But God is our refuge and our strength ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, God, therefore we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, God will never fail. That's something to put on your fridge. That should be on a mug, coffee mug or something. I don't like some of these verses that they put on coffee mugs that are like, oh, that's nice and fancy. No, we need to know the promises of God, that he will never fail, that he will never leave us. Yes. We should never be ashamed. We have no cause to regret in putting our trust in God. There's no reason to feel shameful or be ashamed by putting your trust in God. Because a friend of God never will never have to regret that. In fact, I, I, I think about this. There are more benefits for me than there are for God by saving me. You know, he, I got the good end of the deal. He got me. <laughs> you know, he got, he got me. I got God. And that is what's important. I don't regret that. No need to. Never need to be ashamed of it because we serve the one true God. Time, the time can never come when anyone who is a true friend of God will regret it. There's no need to. Because what God says will happen. What God promises will come true. Verse 19, God says, I have not spoken in secret from somewhere in a land of darkness. I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth and declare what is right. This stands in opposition to the worldly prophets. This stands in opposition to what the world says. See, the world, they speak from secret dark places, but not God. The world uh, is unfaithful. The world is untrue. The world you can't believe, but you can believe God. God speaks the truth. And you know how we know that? He says, I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. No, we can look back and see how faithful and true God was to his word. We can look back at the account of what God has done. We can look back in in our own lives. If you journal, this is a good thing to journal. The times when God spoke to you, the times when God did something for you. I've got a tattoo on my arm that says God is faithful. And that is to remind me of a time when I was worried, when I was like, I don't know, God, I need you to come through. There's no other way. I need you to come through. And he came through big time. He never failed. He never forgot me. And I'm like, I've got to remember that. And that reminds me of that every time. Every time I start to get worried about something, oh, yeah, God did that. Every time I start to think, how am I going to, oh, yeah. God did that. That's what we need. We need to remember those times. And that's what God says. Have I, have I said something wrong? Have I, have I lied? I, the Lord, speak true. I declare what is right, he says. 
Verse 20. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Basically, gather together to worship the one true God. Because everyone else is a little ignorant on this. And God's being nice there. Uh, This is an appeal to the worshipers of idols. You worship, you carry about your idols of wood, and you pray to God that cannot save. There will come a time where those idols will be tested. Wood, hay, stubble, it will all be burned up. But the things that matter will last. The things of God will last. The things done for God will last. The things done for self, they'll just float away, burn up. You'll watch the little ashes go away. And I believe on that day we will fully realize how much of our lives were spent on self and how much of our lives were spent serving God and doing the things of God. And he says, ignorant are those who pray to gods who cannot save. That's like looking to a, a rope. And you're climbing a mountain. And you got this rope hanging there. And you got two ropes. One's nice, new, looks hefty. The other one's got some frays and it. It's a little thin in spots. And you're like, yeah, I, I think I'm going to trust this old rope here. That's what it is like. It's like, uh, so I ride motorcycles, and I, I went on a trip last year. And one of my tires looked a little, yeah, I should change that soon. I think I can make this trip without it. <laughs> Ignorant was I. I trusted in a tire that only got me to, uh, I think we got to rat to, uh, Carlsbad, New Mexico. I was headed a lot further, but I only got to Carlsbad. And that tire was gone. And I had to go pay a hefty price at a Harley dealership to have it replaced. Ignorant was I that trusted in that tire. Ignorant are those who trust in idols to save them. Verse 21. Declare what is to be. Present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me. A righteous God and Savior, there is none but me. God says, take counsel. Look it up. Look it up for yourselves. Search this out for yourselves. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has clearly announced what's the, the coming of Cyrus, the conquest of Babylon, the deliverance from captivity? God's already said he's going to do that stuff. And he's like, look it up. Write it down. Remember this. When that happens, remember it. But the argument is an appeal to the fact that God has clearly foretold these things long ago. And therefore, he is true. He said, you will be captivities, captive to Babylon. They are captivities, they're captives in Babylon. It reminds me of God's response to Job in the book of Job. Job's been complaining to God. His friends have been telling him all this stuff, giving him bad advice. And Job's like, God, just answer me. Sometimes we may not want God's answer. And God goes, I love God's response. God goes, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know. Who stretched out the measuring line across it? Or what were its footings, what, on what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who was there? And, and Job had to answer, <laughs> you. And in fact, he, he's very humbled after he talks to God. Because God says, I am God. Sometimes we fail to remember this. God is God. We are not. And God often will appeal by the proof that he is God alone 
and there's no other God. That he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's a reason why Genesis chapter 1 is in the Bible. Because God not only wants us to know that he created, but he wants us to remember that he was powerful enough to create. He wants us to remember that he created everything, so we should fear nothing. That's why Genesis 1 is in there. Not just for a history lesson on what happened. There is no other God, no one else who can save. He, he says, I'm a righteous God. A God whose attribute is always do what is right. His word is true. His promises are fulfilled. His threats are executed. He always does that which in the circumstances ought to be done. God is faithful. He is true. He is the one true God. God, in his righteousness, will punish the guilty. He declares it in his word. If not, he would not be God because he would not be righteous. He would not be holy if he allowed sin to go unpunished. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. Because sin had to be punished. Because God is holy. He, if he said to Dwayne, Dwayne, you're good. I, I like you. You got a nice car, you're good. Amen. But... Paul, you know, there was that one time, and I, I just can't let you in because there was that one time, that would be unfair. Well, actually, God, unfair is God letting us in and offering us salvation. But that would be unjust if God picked and chose. Picked and chose. If God was treated one better than the other. The Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. He does not look at us with favoritism, except when we believe in his son. It, when it seems like the wicked see, succeed, know this, God will prevail. When it seems like life is unfair, know this, God will come through. That's what he wants us to know in this. He, he's reminding them that he is God, and his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, or greater than our thoughts. And just trust him. Just simply trust God. That's what he's trying to get apart. Uh, in fact, verse 22, he says, Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. We should, why should we look to God? Because there is no other. You can hope in money. Money burns easy. You can hope in your retirement plan or houses or cars. I used to be a tow truck driver. I towed a lot of burned down cars. They stunk. So I can still smell that the melting plastic and everything. It's got a distinct smell and it's horrible. It's, but I had to tow those cars and nothing was kept. <laughs> they were complete losses. Your car's not going to save you. Your house. Remember the fires here in town? The burnt down uh, black forest and all that, yeah. Nothing was saved. Everything went to the ground. I, I hear the story of this guy who's got a gun safe, and he had a house up in Oregon or something, There's fire or Northern California, fires ripped through, and he had this huge gun safe. And the only thing that was standing was the gun safe. But some of the guns had started to melt inside. But it's like nothing can protect you. Nothing in this world can save like God can save. And he says, turn to me. God is true to his promises. He is righteous in his dealings with us. And, and, and he maintains the honor of law. He shows himself in hatred of sin. He despises sin because he knows what it does to us. But he's also merciful and kind, forgiving those who have trespassed him. Slow to compassion, or slow to wrath, quick to compassion, quick to give mercy, grace to those who need it.
grace to those who seek him. It is the basis of our confidence in him. And we should rejoice in the privilege of looking to him for salvation. God could have said, you know what? They messed up. I'm done. God could have raptured the church out 200 years ago. We wouldn't even be here. But God in his mercy said, I'm going to wait because I got some people that I want to bring with me. That's each and every one of us that put our faith and our trust in him, right? The invitation here proves that the offer of the gospel is universal. He says, all the ends of the earth. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. God is willing to save all, not just a select few. This invitation is open to all who would believe in Jesus. There's ample provision for salvation of all. Jesus' death on the cross was enough to save the 7 billion people that are alive right now, 8 billion people that are alive right now, and all the billions that have gone before us. His salvation, or his death on the cross, the penalty that he paid was enough to save everyone. No. God is not willing that any should perish. The angels rejoice when one is saved. Paul in Romans says, just so we know there's no excuse for those who don't. Well, what about the pygmies in Africa? There's no excuse. Um, Paul in Romans says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God. Because for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. They know there's a God. I mean... Jim's been on this kick about the Hubble telescope. In 2006, it focused in on this blank space, blank spot in space. He's been telling us about it all the time. Uh, He's intrigued by it. And it focused in, and I think 400 revolutions of the Earth it took to get this picture of this blank spot. It's a little blank spot. They were like, there's nothing out there. 10,000 galaxies were seen in in that one exposure of that little blank space. Yeah. There is a God. There's no way that was the Big Bang. There's no way. No way by chance that happened. And so God is, wants to be known by all. He wants, to be, he wants all to call him their Savior, their Lord. But like you said, if you receive the offer, many will find out that on that day, their lives were wasted. They were ignorant of the fact that God saves, and that God saves freely and mercifully. The command to, to go forth, or the command, turn to me in all, all the ends of the world and be saved, goes to us too. In Mark 16, 15, uh, Mark writes, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. That's for us. And when we go, it doesn't mean we have to go to Africa or China. You got neighbors. You got co-workers. Do they see the light in you? Oh, you might not have co-workers. You have family. Uh, But do they see the light in you? Do they see God in you? In Genesis, God created mankind to be an image. He created them in his image. We are to be the image bearers of God. We are to, people should look at us and be like, wow, what's, what's different with you, Dwayne? What's wrong with you? You know, you don't seem to be, I've heard you tell this story. People come up to you and they're like, nothing seems to get to you, Dwayne. What's up with that? Paul, I see that smile all the time. What's up with that? God, God saved me. 
It's as easy as that. And we can be confident in that. We can, we can trust that even if they turn around, they're like, I'm leaving. I don't want to hear about it. There was a seed planted. And that's all we're called to do. We're not called to shake them by the shoulders and be like, you've got to get saved. We're not called to punch them. Yeah, we want to. We, we, we don't have to punch them in the face and get them down on their back and, okay, I'm not letting you up till you get saved. That's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. All we're called to do is be an image bearer of God, right? And why? For I am God, he says. This is why we should look to him to be saved, because he is God. It's clear there is none other but the true God. No one else can save. No one else can pronounce forgiveness of sins. No one but God can rescue a soul from deserving hell. That's what we deserve. We deserve hell. We deserve God's punishment. No idol, no man, no angel can save. And if a sinner is saved, it is because of God. Because he is God. And he alone is God. And we must come to the true God and depend upon him. Verse 23. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. God can swear by no greater. He's, you know, we say, I swear by God. Well, he can't say I swear by God, but by myself. You know, that's it. Uh, Hebrews 6, uh, starting verse 13. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there is no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself. And we can trust that his word is true because... He is God. And the Bible says so, yes. It's impossible for God to lie. The writer of Hebrews tells us that. It is impossible for God to lie. He can be trusted. And if he says, I swear by myself, then he, you can take it to the bank. Uh, to, to swear by himself is kind of, as to swear by his life or to affirm, you know, something. Uh, in other, this is expressed in other verses as, as, by the phrase, as I live, says the Lord. And we know God's alive, right? So as I live, you can trust. As long as God's alive, you can trust him. And God will never die. He's eternal. Oh, Satan's going to take armies up against him at some point, but we already know how that ends. The, man, the God who said, let there be light. And then Satan brings an army and God can say, let there be nothing. And they're gone. Or let it be so. And they will go away. We can trust him because he is God. Because his word is true. Philippians 2.10 says, every knee will bow. This is a promise. Every tongue will confess. On that judgment day, even even those who are headed to judgment will have to confess and bow their knee to God. Now, there was another group that bowed their knee in Matthew 27 in mockery. In Matthew 27, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put on a scarlet robe, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on, a head, on his head. Then they put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they mocked him, <coughs> they put, took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him out to crucify. I wonder what it was like the day they stepped into eternity. But that's the choice we make. We can either mock God and mockily bend a knee, or we can bend our knee and worship. Those are the only two choices. We can mock God, or we can trust God. Verse 24, then they will, they will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. 
In the Lord is all righteousness. In the Lord is all strength. This is what it means to trust God. To trust in His righteousness. That He will deal with us in His righteousness. To trust that He will prove His strength to us. That He will be able to overcome anything we come up against in His strength. The main thought is this, that there should be a universal acknowledgement that salvation and strength are in God alone. The devil tries to mess that up. The devil tries to go out and say, oh no, look to this or look to that. The devil dangles that little diamond in front of us or that little sparkly thing in front of us and says, look, you can trust this. The devil's a liar. God is true. God is not a liar. We can trust when he says, I am righteous. I deal with you righteously. I am a God of righteousness. I am a God of strength. I am the God of salvation. We can trust him when he says that. It says, all who have raged have, or all who have rebelled will come to him and be put to shame. Shame or glory? There's the choice. And if we're trusting in ourselves and we're trusting in the things of this world, we will be put to shame like those who have rebelled against him. Verse 25, But all the descendants of Israel, true Israel, will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. Again, only those with faith, only those who put their trust in Yahweh will find justification. The word justification means justice, just as if I never had. That's what Jesus offers us. When he says, I'm going to forgive you, it's just as if you never did sin. Just as if you never rebelled. And that's what God offers us. True forgiveness. No more guilt. No more shame. We don't have to shrink away from him in shame. God forgives us. Justification can only be obtained by the mercy of God. God had mercy on us and offered us forgiveness. God had mercy on us and showed grace to us and offered us salvation. The sum of the New Testament is this, that men are not justified or made right in the sight of God by their own works, but by the mercy and the grace of God. In Hebrews 10, we get this interesting section there. The writer says in verse 35, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Remember, who do we trust in? God. Don't throw away your confidence. Don't see that little dangly thing that Satan's offering you and throw away your confidence in God. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, believed in Jesus, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. Jesus is coming back. We know that. You look at the news and it's like, you're coming back really soon. But Jesus is coming back soon. He will not delay. And my righteous one will live by faith, God says. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we, the writer says, do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. Why? Because of our faith. In God, because we can trust what God said He will do. We can take God as His word. We can trust His word. But to those who have faith, they will be saved. That's what God says. We don't have to be like those who don't have faith. You know, it says that they will shrink back and are destroyed. In Revelation, it says that they will actually crawl into caves and beg for the rocks to fall on them instead of acknowledging God for who He is. So what do we do? First of all, yeah, we pray for those who are... Because God desires that all men would be saved and women. We pray for those. And then we take God at His word. This is a trustworthy word. Every word of it, we can trust God. When He says He will save, he will save. And that alone should give us the confidence and the hope 
to get through each and every day. I uh, heard today, I don't know who it was, but uh, somebody's friend or cousin or something was a pastor, I don't know where, and they committed suicide. It was a pastor that committed suicide. Where's our hope? Where's our confidence? We can trust that God will get us through this day, the next day, the next. And one day, we will see him face to face. Soon. I, there's a song, and I can't remember the title of it offhand because it's on the tip of my mind, where the writer says that one day I will stand shoulder to shoulder with the saints of old. Once you love it, get to heaven, and you're standing there before God, and you look next to you, and I'm sure we'll know who people are. But you look next to you, and you're like, Paul? John? What are you? I'm, I'm not worthy enough to be up here. And they're like, no, no, you're supposed to be up further. Not that there's any order in heaven. But we will stand shoulder to shoulder with the saints of old because of our confidence in, and belief in what God said he will accomplish. Amen? Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for reminding us that we can put our confidence and our faith in you. We thank you for reminding us that your words are true, that you never lie. Lord, that we can trust every word that you say. Lord, I pray for each and every person in here that they would go out of here with more confidence tonight, that they would trust you. I know that we're all dealing with a bunch of stuff, Lord, a bunch of stuff that seems overwhelming. And so, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would hold fast to the promises that you give us in your word, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that we can find our strength in you, that we can trust in you, Lord. And ultimately, one day, when we learn of our, our complete salvation in you, Lord, we, we just thank you that you've promised that. You thank, we thank you that you've, res, you've promised to rescue us from this world, the, the sin, the hurt, the pain of this world, Lord. And that one day we can stand with you in glory. Lord, we can't wait. Please don't wait long, but Lord, we know that there's others that still need to come to know you, so we, we pray that they would make up their minds quickly, Lord. Lord, we, we, uh, we pray for all those. I know every one of us has somebody on our mind that needs to know you. Lord, we, we pray for each and every person in, on our minds, Lord, and we, we give them over to you. We pray that you're continually drawing them to yourself. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Next week, uh, we should be in uh, chapter 46. <laughs> so.